welcome to this month's edition of Alpine Supply Chain's webinar series, 50 Ways to Leave. If you're planning a warehouse move, this is the right session for you. If you're planning to retrofit your facility, this is the right session for you. If you think you're about to either move into a new facility or retrofit your facility, you're in the right spot. First thing we'd like to do is actually uh, find out a little bit about our uh, participants today. So there is a uh, poll question that we'd like you to fill out. And while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the fact that everybody is currently muted. We're going to use the chat and we're going to use the actual message board. I will be actually monitoring that and asking our panelists for questions. So as you can see, the poll is up and uh, we would appreciate if you guys would fill that out. And we will leave that up. Ron, if you could progress to the next slide for me. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we understand um, what we're talking about today. And then there is a legal disclaimer that this information discussed in this session represents the views of individuals, does not constitute legal advice. Um, you should consult with your organization's leadership and legal counsel. All right, now we got the legal disclaimers out of the way. Let's go to the third slide, Ron. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Wollen. I will be your moderator mm -hmm. today. I'm managing principal with Alpine Supply Chain Solutions based in St. Charles, Illinois, and uh, 30 plus years of supply chain experience. I am happy to share with you our two panelists today. Believe it or not, the first Ron Rafey and I have known each other since 1996 and played on a men's hockey league. Uh, back in the day. Uh, Ron is a lifelong supply chain professional with a background in operations, consulting, DC design, optimizations, and facility implementations. Ron is a professional that gets projects completed on time and on budget, a problem solver, and a team player with experienced, uh, high-performing teams. Um, Ron does his best when focusing on challenging, whether it's within the four walls or global network. He's got 30 plus years and has created several um, successful projects and value for his clients. And we're really happy to have Ron here today. In addition, I've been uh, known, uh, I, uh, Brad Steger and I have known each other since 1999. Um, so I'm happy to say that I have a, a good network of long lasting supply chain executives. Uh, Brad is the go-to guy when it comes to putting together big picture plans for big projects. Through his career, he's tapped into many um, first-time ever projects, including uh, production of Catalyst, the WMS first annual plan, uh, Agilent's uh, first Sarbanes Oxley certification, and Appian's first acquisition. Uh, Brad enjoys exploring uncharted territories and finding new ways to add value. Brad also has 30 plus years of supply chain management experience focused on warehouse management, software, mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, program and project management. He's worked for a number of industry-leading retailers, wholesalers, and pharmaceutical companies. Brad finds supply chain incredibly dynamic, and he loves his work, and he's very passionate about it. So today, we've got two very veteran people that are going to talk to us about mm -hmm. how to plan a warehouse move. So with that being said, Ron, I'll hand it over to you. Um, actually, while we're on this slide, David, can you present the poll results for us? Right. So we got a couple people within six months, a couple people 18, 24, and no plan. And if you are planning to move, it's the expanding and consolidation. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Ron. Yeah. So uh, regardless of why you're planning to move, you know, let's talk about these, uh, um, about the three keys. And uh, we have them as uh, have a plan, have a layout, and resources. So the famous General Eisenhower quote about plans says to me that the pl process of planning, and not just for the blue sky, easy path scenarios, but some contingency planning as well, will allow you to be flexible. Um, have a firm layout. Uh, we need some constants in the planning process and the layout needs to be one of them. Uh, also having a firm location addressing scheme that will allow you to be flexible in the future um, is important. We help uh, clients move in and stay flexible with location schemes that allow them to change as their business changes. And we help provide the right sized facility 
with the right layout and storage strategy. Um, so Ron, it sounds like we're going to talk about, yes, yeah, so we, we've got uh, some space, we got some equipment, we got some labor, and then hopefully Brad will bring home the system side of this because it's not just the uh, physical, we also have to talk about the systematic approach. Exactly. And then uh, from, uh, from a resources perspective, you know, have dedicated resources focused on the mission, and at a minimum, a dedicated project manager. Now, realistically, everyone has a day job, but scope the time allocation of your key resources in your key departments required for the move piece alone and then you know document and communicate up and down the the organization so that short-term uh, refocusing of their objectives um, is is key to these resources and make sure that they can um, accomplish what they're focused to do The move plan is really a game of Tetris, right? Keeping an eye on the moving pieces and arranging them to fit nicely at the right time, all while keeping the doors open and the orders flowing. So today we're gonna to discuss this Tetris, the Tetris pieces of the physical and the systems aspects of a move. Um, specifically on the physical aspect, the storage equipment, or racking or other media, a product, uh, your equipment, operational equipment, and then Personnel. Um, people don't always think about that as a as a puzzle piece, but it really is. It's and it's rather key. Um, and then from the systems aspect, we're going to look at the network, the equipment, and then the the personnel piece of that as well. All while keeping the site in business, right? You got to keep uh, up and running while you're changing the business. So uh, while considering. Um, how the size of the move matters and how the size influences whether you're moving just during the weekday, or you're moving uh, weekends, um, and uh, if you can take advantage of weekend cutovers as well. So uh, all that is, is part of the move plan. So Ron, it's interesting is um, if you think about it, Mark Andy was like, hey, listen, I've got my 80,000 square feet. I'm going to expand into another 40,000 square feet, but I still need to ship 3,500 orders a day. Right, that was a, a retrofit. Another one that we had was APL, right? 400,000 square feet. And they're like, listen, I need to ship 7,000 orders a day while we change our existing environment. So I think those two are completely different than, you know, Midwest, um, where we were moving into a brand new facility, School Health moving into a brand new facility, Monet moving into a brand new facility. So when you can go into a greenfield, it's probably a lot easier than doing a retrofit. So I'm really excited to hear about how we should maintain our operations while we're making these changes to our facility. Good point, Michael. So uh, in the facility move, racking is generally the most predominant storage media, but regardless of the storage media, moving it will require you know, building access, whether it's a certificate of occupancy or a temporary CO, uh, find out early what those requirements are. You know, they, they differ all across the country. Starter rack is needed if you're planning to reuse your existing rack. And I'm not sure if everyone knows what starter rack is, but it's you know when you can't take down, or uh, I'm sorry, yeah, when you're moving product from, uh, when you're moving your racking from your existing facility to your new rack, uh, you need some rack in the new facility to get started. Um, you can't take product down of your existing rack and then just magically have it appear installed at the new site, right? So it gives you a place to move product. Um, but build in realistic lead times, even if you're buying uh, new steel, or especially if you're buying new steel, um, or if you're getting it used, because potentially you need to um, get that uh, certified. But uh, timing is uh, timing can be thrown off with that uh, starter rack if it's not in place on time. Uh, and you certainly can't be placing product on the floor in order to take down your existing rack. It just doesn't work. Um, it only causes double, triple handling, and you uh, immediately have some space issues if you try to keep product available on the floor without racking. And the only reason I bring that up is because we have some clients who, who tried to do that, and um, it was a surprise to them. So if you're planning to use used racking, you know, you know, will the rack layout structure need to be certified from a professional engineer? Uh, that's something that uh, not everyone thinks about. Um, does the steel meet the requirements of the new elevations and the new loads? That's something that's not easily, uh, easily 
figured out by uh, um, by someone who's not prof a professional engineer who's not going to stamp the drawings. Um, and then the damage inspection. You know, this can be used for uh, used racking, but also if you're reallocating current racking, damage inspection really should be done and performed by the party responsible for the installation because they're the ones who can actually have to sign off on it. Um, there's uh, there's also a surefire way to relabel racking without removing the old labels. And that's simply, you know, pull the back beams and use them in the front for a clean beam look. Um, however, it's, it's not exactly a new strategy, you know, depending on the age of the facility and the, the life cycle of those beams, this trick may have been done before. And you might be left with uh, the need to use uh, beam tape as shown in this photo. So regardless if you're using, uh, if you're reusing rack or if it's all new, you're still gonna have to gain access to the building and move product systematically. Um, but the timing of the new rack is uh, key to a successful plan. You know, you can be quoted from a, a rack vendor, the, hey, production ready dates. So you know when the, the rack is ready, but then there's also a shit date. And then where is it coming from? So there's transportation. And uh, depending on the time of the year, there might could be delays in that transportation. Um, and then when the product actually, or the product, when the racking actually shows up, you need to be sure that the crew is available to accept offload and then stage that steel for, uh, for building purposes. So it's all about the timing. So uh, regardless of your uh, reusing racking, again, if it's, or if it's all new, uh, what will be the driving uh, force? What's the sequence of installation at your facility? You know, basically you have a choice to move out of a site or into a site. Um, and you can move into a site by area. You know, that might be the driver for you. It could be for security reasons, maybe fences or cameras and gates, uh, potentially valuable inventories involved. And you have to have that in place before you start to move or potentially just production reasons where you have, uh, um, well, you need to reduce downtime, right? How can I best keep production going on, but you know, not be down at all. Or maybe you have a new technology that you wanna get that up and running before anything else. Um, you know, another driver is just, you know, pure customer demands. Hey, this customer needs to be serviced first. I'm moving their product and making sure it's the first one in place. So Ron, right now I'm uh, speaking to you from the uh, Nashville uh, Admirals Club where I was just on site for one of our clients, Patty Wax. And the first thing that they're installing is the VLM. What's interesting is we just had the situation with Monet, um, Nashville, as of uh, the beginning of the year, only general contractors can uh, sequester permits for installation. So um, probably 30 or 40 warehouses in my career, the installer can actually ask for permits. But now we've had it twice in two counties in two different states. So we need to really start to look at local county regulations and who can get the permits and uh, the timing of that. So right now there's a probably a four to six week lead time to get permits uh, to get a uh, rack installed. So just uh, interesting that uh, you talked about the timing and then, you know, what do you install first? So they're putting the VLMs in first and they're gonna put the, uh, uh, the pixel light. And then after that, they're gonna go ahead and put the racks. So that way there's a sequential process to, you know, installing it. And up there in Minnesota for Archway, we get the same thing. If we start installing certain rack, you can't get to the other side of the building. So there's a there's a process right. to that installation as well. Exactly. Right. And uh, not only whether it's uh, customer demands, but you know, possibly could be a, a pick line that you want up and running first. Maybe you, you're you putting in cart and flow where you got some faster pick, pick uh, units per hour and you want that in and, and you want it to test it before everything else. All kinds of scenarios, but uh, it, it's unique to each each customer, um, and uh, and there are similar reasons for to move strictly by customer or by project as well. And then tearing down and setting up racking, right? You know, if you're reusing racks, you know that can get as granular as needed, depending on the move out plan and the uh, and the variety of storage methods um, scattered throughout the site. So we have a recent customer of ours that have, they've got single deep, they've got double deep, 3D pushback, drive-in rack and shelving and scattered throughout the facility, really. It's not just in one place. Um, and it wasn't necessarily all purchased at the same time. And so there's varying beam sizes 
And uh, on the, in this little snippet, you can see some very specific uh, um, recs being scheduled for specific areas in the new site because of how granular we needed to get. Um, but it's all about you know, get, making sure you get the right product being the, uh, the racking product at the right place at the right time. Yeah, one of, one of the things to note on that, Ron, that was certainly key when we were working with the installer, you know, to go through and look at existing racking was to identify damaged and then identify we need extra racking and where to source that from. And it's not just right. just because you're using it today doesn't mean it's going to pass an inspection in a new facility tomorrow. Um, and that was really critical when we were using, you know, looking at the reuse of racking in that situation. Yeah, good point. And then, uh, so that was the racking aspect, really. So the, but the, the product aspect is similar, but with a little bit of a twist, because generally it's not the same person that's responsible for both, right? Moving product into starter rack, you know, you have to make sure that uh, the installation is progressing as it should. It's not your main focus, but you want to make sure it's still going. Um, and that may depend on the number of racking crews and the location and the distance that they are from each other. Um, but the transportation of product between sites can really create gaps and or surges of trailers available um, at both the loading end of it and the unloading end of it. And it really shouldn't be taken lightly, you know, given that uh, the, the driven dist that it's driven by the distance between the sites, right? When trucks um, pick up, when they, when they can uh, deliver. And um, you know, if you're really close, like some of our clients have been, it, it's nice, but when you, it stretches out a little bit, it creates some, uh, a little bit, bit of a bullet effect. And then we have the product inventory is one of my favorite topics, right? Um, so, you know, is, if, is your site full of product? Is product stored in trailers? Is there offsite storage site somewhere? Now is a great time to ask yourself, why are we moving it? Why, why is it there? You know, it could be there for a reason, but, you know, sometimes it's just because the accountants don't want to get rid of it or the customer doesn't know why they're keeping it either, but it's a good time to liquidate, right? Um, Brad, do you know of any customers who have a situation like that? Yeah, absolutely, Ron. You know, customer we're working with, they've got, uh, you know, 20, 25% of the product in their warehouse is, is, you know, offsite or, you know, as you mentioned down below here, dead, right? And so how do they go about identifying how to get rid of that product, working with their clients and things like that. Um, and then coordinating that as part of, you know, sometimes they don't see what's there, right? Cause it's offsite. Right. And uh, you know, being able to report off of it in the systems and, and clearly identify that with the client became a critical piece of their move, their overall move plan. Right. Uh, distribution in center. fact, where I'm at, Go ahead, where I'm at right now, they, they identified 825 pounds worth of discontinued items that they need to sell off. And 825 pound positions is a lot. They can free up some space because right now they're low. Uh, I think they're at 98.9% .9 full occupancy. So if we can get rid of some of those dead and obsolete or canceled items, that'll free up some space for them. Right. And everyone doesn't know that it's that, that much product is dead, you know, until we identified it for them. Anyway, so great time to liquidate, right? So uh, the goal really is to move what you have to move. Um, and hopefully this inventory aspect was considered when you sized your building, right? And you're gonna make a move, you know, are, are you, did you plan on moving all that dead inventory? Ho hopefully not. Um, but then with that, with that move out, you know, a short range forecast will help the focus how much inventory of which SKUs need to stay. You know, if you need to maintain um, operating out of one facility, um, because it's uh, it'll all be driven by inventory classification, right? So you got your dead items which haven't moved in forever. You know, you can either move it first or you can move it last. You know, depending on your strategy. Um, your C items, which are slower, easier to forecast, probably minimal risk as far as stock out goes. Um, B, you'll have some risk. And then you got the A items where you're going to manage that risk, right? Generally, there's these are the SKUs with more stock on hand, hopefully. They're your A's. You, you have that product to sell. But um, you can focus on these 20% of the SKUs during 80% of your throughput. And it's um, it makes it a lot easier because you know where to uh, put your time and effort. And 
And then uh, we can use tools driven by inventory reports of orders and storage locations, and then provide a heat map uh, or heat maps, you know, plural, based on what makes sense for you, whether it's um, activity based on lines or quantities based on units on hand or simply a, a position full, position empty kind of view. Um, off to the left, there's just a little clip snippet of a, of a customer where this is the racking and these are the, the the storage media and all the green shows no activity in those in those queues. There's product there, there just hasn't been activity. And then the the orange and the red shows where the, the high hitter hitting items are. So we can use that as an aid for the planning process of how you're going to disassemble the beast, right? And then ultimately drive the manpower requirements needed to do that. You know what's going to be easier to do. Well, Ron, you know, my favorite thing is uh, slotting, right? So if you're going to actually do a move, what better way to slot and make sure that you put the item in the right four pick location and get the reserve closer to the four pick location to minimize replenishment travel. So um, you have storage type analysis to identify the ideal size and quantity of four pick location and then slotting to determine exactly which aisle level bay row position it should go into. And once you have that, you can actually start going out and putting physical placards on, knowing that, hey, this product is going to go to this location, and you can start prepping for the move. Exactly. Good point. And then we got the uh, the Tetris uh, equipment piece of it. You know, equipment is similar uh, is a similar game as the racking, and it's also driven by your move strategy. You know, what uh, is needed where and how much. Um, but MHE is really a step function, right? Your material handling equipment, because a third of a rack, a forklift need is actually rounds up to a full forklift need, right? And because that need, uh, and because of that rental equipment could be needed at both sites, um, could be because your, uh, the product pull down and loading move product at your existing site, you need some extra manpower there, you know, because you're still needing to maintain your order flow. Um, or at the other end of the site, you could be need some extra rentals for uh, trailer unloading. Um, and, or it could be because your new site has a higher clear, clear height, right? You're moving to a better building, you're growing, and the, uh, the lead time for MHE equipment is longer than you think it should be. Um, so you have to rent for, for a period of time. You mean kind of similar to Asmo Day? They had a higher clear height in their building, but their fork trucks didn't go as high, so we had to reduce the height of that top beam so they didn't have to buy new material handling equipment. So you can either, you know, make the decision on the equipment, or you can make the decision on the material handling. But you gotta, you gotta make sure you track all things to make sure everything operates together once you're in your new building. Right. Sizing that right facility is a, is a different subject, right? <laughs> But yes, people make choices on uh, based on what they they want to not change or they want to change. So the operations equipment is the same uh, Tetris game, right? And it's driven by that that move strategy as well. You know what's needed where and how much. But um, often this type of equipment can be moved in fractions. So if you you can move a third of it early and then move the remainder maybe at a cutover date. But certainly production or work cell equipment can tr be transitioned. Tough word for me today. Transition smoothly um, because it's, it's this is one area. Yeah, this is this is one area. I think uh, inbound staging, outbound staging when you move it into a building sometimes doesn't get the, the time and attention it needs. But the other one is value added services. So whether you're doing, you know, um, kidding or some sort of, you know, work uh, on the floor, making sure that the layout is properly um, designed to accommodate your different bills of material and then safety and providing a, a safe work environment and ergonomic uh, work environment for your employees. So this is a big part that you can improve from your current operation. Right. And uh, not as easy is, uh, is with the dock equipment, right? So stretch wrappers and such, security cages or cameras and equipment, driver's cages, these kinds of things are all required usually at both sites. And yet at the same time, if you're if you're moving in and uh, needing to operate out of both. So uh, new purchases are often needed for this type of equipment. Um, and, you know, you can certainly manually stretch wrap for a while if uh, if you're allowed to. But um, just plan on plan on that in the budget. Right. Which 
Absolutely. Almost, we're not even talking about budgets. We're just talking about the move, but uh, don't be so concerned about we, the budget. Yeah, we've talked about space, we've talked about equipment, we've talked about labor. Let's talk about the system side of this move. In a second, we got personnel first, right? Oh, so, I thought we so, talked about labor. All right. Well, a little bit more, you know, a little bit more. So the, the right. personal right. Tetris really is the hardest considering that trained labor is not really waiting uh, for you to call. Um, the focus here is really identifying the key departments and the key players in those departments and with their help, right, develop some realistic expectations of move unit per hour numbers. You know, understand where the uh, where to place temporary label labor is uh, with the least impact to sensitive areas of your business. You know, everyone has something that's uh, sensitive to them, whether it's the inbound or the picking or the put away. Um, and then, uh, you know, work with your current system and its current challenges because they're not going away. Um, but considering all that, then then we can staff accordingly. Right. And then uh, finally, on a, on a personal aspect, you know, your site and your strategy you know, will dictate whether you're doing this uh, weekend moves only um, or you're doing the weekends and weekdays. Um, but w whatever your way to go is, you know, you can plan by function. And this shows a little bit of snippet of literally where we're putting real names um, in a place so you know who's expected where and when. And you do this for the warehouse functions, the transportation, if you own your own trucks, um, and uh, any office support uh, to make everyone accountable to each other, right? But with this, given real UPH expectations, what could go wrong? <laughs> All right. If you plan, nothing will go wrong, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, no worries. It's more about uh, having the contingency plan in place. But uh, let, let's hear about the system side now. Yeah. So, like you said, Michael, you know, we've got the storage, racking, equipment, inventory, personnel. Oh, that should be it, right? Uh, not so fast. We've got systems. So, what are you, you know, what are you running your existing operation on? Um, can you extend? the current systems, whether it's warehouse management or labor management or transportation, parcel manifesting, you know, do you have voice, do you have RF, or do you require a new instance and what's your relationship with your vendors and what's your licensing requirements that need to take place? Um, everything that's gonna go into those decisions around integrations with your ERP system, integration with your customer, um, all of those things that, uh, that'll need to be put into place there. Um, from a from an existing systems point of view. Um, don't underestimate the amount of work that's there. IT, as soon as they find out, it's going to tell you it's going to be forever for them to do it. But uh, once you get your arms around what needs to happen, they step up and start delivering. Um, the key, though, starts to become around the overall network, the um, existing environment that, that's there. So how quickly just just as Ron talked about from a racking perspective, how quickly can you get access to the site? How quickly can you get access to the site to start putting in you know, your network and access points for radio frequency? What do, what do you need for um, you know, a voice system or you know, a pick the light system that are, that's gonna go into, in there as well? So it's critical that you understand that and what the lead times are from local network vendors and as well as your other vendors that may be assisting with any of that network infrastructure type of thing. Um, do you need to run new line, new electrical lines for your pack stations, your workstations that are out there? Michael talked about a safe working environment, new environment, you know, new requirements and all of those type of things um, that go in. Do you have enough equipment in your existing facility? Do you need to rent? Do you need to um, double up? Is the old equipment available depending on how old you are? Um, you know, if you have to get new equipment, what does that mean to your newest new, um, you know, to your old system, but you're, you're attaching new technology to it. Do you wanna introduce any new technology, right? A lot of people wanna focus just on the move, but sometimes during the move, this is a great opportunity with new staff, um, a new operation to make small tweaks and put in new technology into your, into your environment to help you run more efficiently, more effectively. And then operations infrastructure, something you probably don't think about on a day in and day out basis, but what's the overall building security? 
What are your internal and external access points? Do you have any security badging requirements that need to go on? And then we talked about a little bit about the configuration and testing work cells and things like that. So you've got a pack station with a new address. Are you printing out the correct labels at a, at a parcel manifesting station? What are you integrating to um, in this test environment if you're using you know, your existing instance? Um, how does that work if you've now got two different uh, addresses that are in place? And so there's a whole variety of things that need to take place when you start looking at the infrastructure um, from a systems point of view here that need to be coordinated, not only within your IT department, but also your vendors and your operational staff, because they're the ones that use it day in and day out. They know how it should function. And you need to make sure you've got proper lead times to make you know, any adjustments if there are problems in that, in that environment. So Brad, what's interesting is early in my career, I did a lot of projects in um, Thomaston, uh, South Carolina, where all the textiles mills had like a uh, chain link fence and then a barbed wire fence on the top. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty heavy duty security. You know, given the world that we're living in today and all the situations and incidents that are taking place, building security has actually become quite a big topic for a lot of the warehouse employees and then even um, between the warehouse and the office and making sure that there are, you know, very, very dedicated checkpoints and different security level passes. So um, even with some of our clients where they've got secured items, non-secured items, vaulted items, you know, it's, it's, it's always been within the four walls, but now we're seeing it more on the personnel. Where are people coming in? Where's the exit? Um, and being able to make sure that there's a safe exit for all employees and then where the break room is and how the travel in the facility in and out impacts the layout. So it's become a hotter topic than I've ever seen it before. So relatively uh, recent and, you know, something that I hadn't really thought of before until uh, recently. So that's yeah, a great, we're, great we're point. We're definitely seeing that right now, Michael, you know, critical to any approval, any plans, full, full fire and safety plan, right? You know, you think about some of the things that are occurring. So what are, how did, how quickly can people get out? How well is it marked? Um, all of that becomes critical. And as you said, separating, um, you know, from a security point of view, the warehouse from the office and, you know, how do you get back and forth from those locations and all of that needs to be taken into account. And it's, it's an extra step that may not have been there before the last time you may have done this. Point. So when you think about racking and IT systems and inventory and personnel and everything else, right? The key to all of this focus is around communications. Um, and whether it's your customers, your carriers, your partners, and, and a variety of other things, um, keep the, the right constituents um, informed, good and or not so good. I won't say bad because you're planning, which means um, you're, you're, you know, three steps ahead in, in the game as it goes, but keep them informed on what the plan is, what your progress mm -hmm. against the plan is, when you have new information, if the plan has changed, right? The expectation is we're going to learn new stuff almost every single day as you go through this, uh, this process of moving and, uh, anything that's got an impact, get that communicated out. So you've got people that are informed. The worst thing you want to do is, is catch somebody off guard. Um, you know, carriers, it's, you know, you've got a whole whole bunch of new stuff um, that, that's going on with, you know, new addresses, new, you know, they're used to coming to your existing building. Well, now you're three miles down the road or you're 18 miles down the road. The last thing you want them to do is show up and say, uh, where are you? Um, so make sure you're communicating there as much as possible. Um, you know, as you, as you as you go through all of this, the partners as well. So anybody else that, that you're using in that uh, in that process to help you and assist, make sure that they understand you know what you're doing, um, that they're not outside of, of what's going on as well. Hey, uh, just for all the attendees, again, you're all muted, but please feel free to use the chat or the Q and A session. Uh, Brad, Ryan, we got one that came in, and I don't know what uh, category this falls into, but what about backup power? and backup options. I was in a warehouse that did a move plan um, and didn't have a plan for, for backup generators. And when the city lost power for three days, they were scrambling. So what are we seeing with regards to alternative power sources? 
Yeah. So usually alternative power sources in my uh, experience are expensive, right? So it's, it's a risk, whether you're going to plan for that up, uh, up front and, um, and, and really uh, it depends on how much it costs and what you're going to, you know, where's the ROI on the risk factor. Yeah. Michael, the, one of the clients I'm working with right now, they are putting in an alternative power source. Um, it probably won't be in day one, but it's going to be in pretty quickly thereafter. Um, they're running, uh, they're running new lines in. They're um, running it to multiple stations within the warehouse um, itself. It won't be the full warehouse, but it'll be a, a level that'll allow them to meet. Uh, minimum service levels, maybe not optimal service levels, but that's that's where they decided on the risks, you know, the risk scale where to operate. So our client in Miami actually used um, the power source and the backup generator that was uh, part of the building as one of the criteria for their uh, their uh, site selection because they're in Miami with hurricanes is a prevalent thing that happens down there. So uh, it was interesting to make that part of the uh, the checklist for the new facility. Yeah, That's and, a great one. and depending on what industry you're in, Michael, like it's super critical in those emergency situations. I worked with a medical um, supplier and they had commitments to FEMA and things like that. So they were fully, you know, they had to operate on optimal um, levels. And so that their backup there was critical because they were called on in those emergency situations. All right. All right. Keep the questions coming. Um, you know, PO cutover. So when are you going to stop shipping to your existing facility and start, you know, receiving into your new facility, right? What's the timing on that? You don't want to run out of stock in your existing facility and have it all over in another facility. And so understanding what the lead times are, understanding what your forecast levels is that, that Ron talked about, you know, becomes critical in making that determination. And the last thing you want to do is be shipping into your existing facility just to turn around a week later and say, oh, let's move these several truckloads over to the new facility, right? So, you know, it, it's a cost factor and, and a risk factor that you have to, you know, build into it and it takes time to, to work through that. Michael, yeah, I laughing. think um, we're... Yeah, we, we, we had a situation where, you know, obviously we wanted to get all the shipments we could to the new facility and start to uh, dwindle down. So we left all of the A items and two weeks worth of inventory and the B items. And you know what is, uh, it worked out really, really well, but they were like, what? What do you mean? We're going to start diverting our shipments already. And we're like, yeah, why would you bring them here? We're, we're moving over there and you're going to have to touch it twice. So the timing of that will be crucial. Um, and, you know, what, what I want to talk on here is vending, right? If you're an executive, you think, oh, who cares about vending? And I, I had somebody early in my career that said, don't sweat the little stuff. And then he said, something I learned a long time ago was little stuff has definitions and it depends on who the audience is as to what the little stuff is. And so, you know, as Ron talked about working on the weekends, working second or third shift, right? You're asking your team to step up and do something above and beyond. You may be rewarding them with extra pay and, and bonuses and all of those type of things, but it also may be, do they have a clean break room to sit down and have a snack? Do they have a vending machine? And it's those little things that may be a really big thing or something that somebody on your team notices and says, why aren't they taking care of us? And so um, don't overlook anything that's out there and have somebody you know look at it and make it their big thing. It may not be your little thing it may be your little thing but make it make it somebody else's so you know things that may be on the last of the list could be the very first thing your warehouse workers want they want a snack when they're working 12 or 14 hour shifts so brad i am not kidding you just yesterday patty wax switched out their entire vending room so they've got a nice break area they got the cabinets they always have coffee but yesterday a whole crew came in and took all the old vending machines out and put all new stuff in sandwiches and a microwave and and then heated food and cold food and i mean i was like holy cow like it was impressive and uh, i asked uh, george the ceo i said um uh, the coo i apologize joseph the ceo i said what well, was the uh you know the improvement in the break area and he literally said we we started with two shifts 
And now we might actually start doing weekends and a lot of the places near them aren't open. So they wanted to be able to provide that for their team and their crew. And it was the small things that really make an impact on employee staff. So it's, it's yeah. interesting you bring that up. Absolutely. Um, you know, equipment services, right? So your material handling equipment, you know, if you're not servicing it yourself, you're leasing and, and all of that. Hey, we've got stuff in two buildings now over, you know, a period of time. These moves, you know, we're working on a move right now that, uh, started at the end of last month and is going to run probably through the end of August, maybe in bleed into September. Like it's a six month time frame. <laughs> um, you know, so you've got to communicate with the appropriate people. Um, you move into a new facility, landscaping, plowing, right? You don't want to be the, you know, you want your to be a showcase in your new building, right? Executives want to come in and show clients and customers, hey, look at what we have here. Do you have the right people lined up to take the, you know, that uh um you know, curbside appeal and, and proper. And, you know, if you live up in the north, like today, where it's snowing in Wisconsin, right, is plowing uh, important and what's your contract there? Don't laugh. Um, and then as you go through this, right, your most important asset is your people. They're the ones that are going to make this happen. Um, you know, what's the impact on them? Who's Who's got a, you know, what's the distance that they're moving? Are there any new processes that are taking place? You know, do you need to train them? You most, you know, certainly going to be bringing on new employees, um, put your first foot forward, um, all of those different types of things that may need to take place around training. Um, so communicate, communicate. Yeah so, yeah, so we had a question, and, and it might not be an exact answer, but the question was, what percentage of your labor should you plan to allocate for the move? Or what percentage of staff increases should be allocated for the move. So think about it. If you've got 20 people in your warehouse for the move, what percentage should you increase for the allocation? So I, I know it's a different way to approach it. And, and in my mind, I think what we do is we look at, hey, we're going to move 20,000 power positions and we know that we can do 35 an hour based on that at X amount of people. And then we do it over X amount of days. We know how many X amount of hours and then we develop a labor plan. So to answer the question, it might not be an exact percentage of your existing crew. We reverse it. We take a look at all the labor that needs to be done, how many hours a day, the equipment that's needed, and then the labor to do it. And then we associate the labor to the plan. Um, and if you're constrained, then we can you know, change it out. Um, there was a client of our school health. They thought that they could move over a weekend. When we showed them the number of power positions, the number of um, at time it takes to grab a pallet, load it onto a trailer, how many trailers, how to take it, unload it. They realized it was a seven day effort, not a two day effort. So um, it, it's actually uh, maybe not an exact percentage of your existing, but more about the plan, how many pieces that you have to move over what duration and how many hours a day can you dedicate towards it and, and be able to look at it that way. Unless uh, Brad or Ryan, if you get a different uh, way to answer it. No, I think that was a great answer. The only thing I would say was also it depends, like you said, you were saying on the constraints. Do you need to do it over a week? Do you need to do it over a short amount of time all at once? You can throw everybody at it, or is it going to be spaced out over weeks? And then that's where you're talking about a fraction of your of your team. So it's all about uh, you know what you're you can handle. Yeah, like you said, Michael, that you know kind of mini engineering time standard. What you know, what's the time effort for? individual tasks, calculating the number of tasks that need to be done. The general assumption is, you know, you're doing this at a, at a downtime in your operation. And the reality is nobody has a downtime. I had a customer that once said to me, um, when it, to the question of, you know, what's your peak, peak period? And his response was yesterday and tomorrow will be my next peak period. It's whether it's going out of the warehouse, coming into the warehouse, he goes, we do not have downtime anymore. We don't have, you know, seasonality that we used to. It's it's real time um, e-commerce and, and the sense of, you know, everybody wants it tomorrow. Um, there really weren't any peaks for their business anymore. So, um, it, you know, there, there's a number of things that go into it. And it could be, you know, like Ron said, you know, are you doing weekends or second shift and can you extend your staff or um, do you need to add staff? Perfect. Let's wrap this bad boy up. 
Yeah. So let's wrap it up. So we covered you know, racking, the physical piece of it, the rack, the product, the equipment, the people. Brad. Yeah. So, um, like I said, you got to make decisions around your systems. You got to make involve IT as quickly as you can on the equipment and uh, everything that goes in on the network side of things. And lastly, communicate. Everyone is in your supply chain. Communicate to everybody up and downstream of, of what you're doing with the right information at the right time and show them that you've got a plan and are in control. Right. So basically, you know, we're you're running two operations at once. And I think I stepped over you, Brad. You were just gonna no, take Yeah, no, but like you said, you're running two. You're running your existing facility and you know, you've got a whole brand new facility that you're building out and filling up and receiving it. Um don't underestimate the impact on and just fill in after that. Your resources, your equipment, your staff, you name it, there will be an impact on them. And don't miss the opportunity to, you know, to, to introduce some change, right? You've got the ability to, to put some change in here. If you manage it correctly, you're going to get satisfaction out from everybody as you go through this process to move your business forward. So obviously you've heard from Brad, myself, and Ron, but don't take it from us. Take it from one of our customers. So last year before the world shut down, uh, the first week of uh, March, uh, Beth uh, from School Health was uh, a speaker at Modex and talked about how School Health moved into their new facility and lessons learned. You know, the location addressing system, making sure you have the rack properly sized in the inbound and outbound staging location. It's, uh, it's a great, great uh, session, and hopefully you guys will take a look at it. Uh, we'll send this PowerPoint presentation out to everybody. So, Ron, if you go to the last slide for me, I want to thank all of our attendees for attending this month's uh, webinar session. Um, feel free to give us a call. Reach out to us. We can have you. And then the last one is, don't forget, next month, uh, we're going to be talking about the Da Vinci Charger. So, chargers are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, Jim Chamberlain, Senior Managing Director from Alpine, will be reviewing uh, the battery chargers in that industry. So 220 on that one. Uh, for those of you that are, uh, you know, um, attending today, thank you so much for your time and energy. We'll send out a recording and the uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, thank you so much and have a phenomenal day.